This is Captain Jason Rogers aboard the um, Starship Grover or something. We have honed in on your distress beacon. Whoever you are, we wish to be of service. I have a bad feeling about this. Fear not, MacNog. I am certain we are in no immediate danger in this sector of space. After all, we are in the neutrals, I mean, the friendly sector of space. Good save there. Look, MacNog, ever since the Franken Zone was relocated to space, after the three of us got drunk and joined the Space Academy, where we learned you were in fact an alien of the planet Fat Gas, you have show nothing but ill will toward our mission. Maybe because I'm an alien from a planet where farts are food and our leader is a giant anus. And that's not a colorful metaphor. He literally is a giant anus. Look, see? <sighs> Just accept your fate and move on, Macnog of fat gas. Yeah, that's easy for you to say. You're a fucking captain. After befriending the old hermit on planet Tattoo, to, to Tunarama, you learn that your true parents were starship captains, real heroes of space and all that shit. And now you're carrying on that legacy. Everybody got that? Yeah, yeah, yes, that is true. I do come from a long line of space heroes. But rest assured, old chum, I would trade places with you any day. No, you wouldn't. No, no, I wouldn't. Uh. That's it, I need a snack. Mark Mac Macnog, uh, what, what the hell are you doing? We also drink our farts too. <sighs> Beep up, boop, bap. Captain, I am picking up life forms heading in our direction. Thank you, Roboscop24601. Ever since you died in that microwave explosion and were assembled by top men fashioned in the most advanced cyber neck technology, your robotic skills have served as a great asset aboard our ship. Bleep, blop, bloop. <laughs> you said ass. See, you're a captain. Scott's like a super robot or something. How come I have to be a freaking alien from fat gas? Beep, bop, bibbity, boppity, boop. Because you suck. And because you're fat and have gas. Hey man, bloop, so barber, flag a scarf, look into you. Beep, bop, beep. What did you say? I just told you off in my language, my native language. Fat Gassian or something. What does that mean? I have absolutely no idea. No. Beep boop, Captain, we are under attack. Dear Lord, it's a trap. Told ya. Hail that vessel, MacNog. Whatever. This is Captain Jason Rogers aboard the Slimith Yop. Do him. We need you no harm. Repeat, we mean you no harm. Jeez. It's okay. I'm fine. Okay. All right, Roboscop 24601. What sort of life are we dealing with? It appears to be asshole, sir. You want me to kill him? No, not yet, not yet. We must be responsible for our intergalactic warfare. I think we're a little late for that. Our shields are dropping, sir. Beep, bop, boop. We don't have shields. Beep, bop, boop. Well, then we're screwed. Boop. We must see the threat. Figure out what we're dealing with here. Yeah, that'll make a difference. On screen, MacNog! Please would be nice. My God. A couple of random ships never ever before seen in any series of sci-fi movies. Beep up. What do we do, Captain? Their vast technology and weaponry is far too superior to ours. Especially their copyright lawsuit lasers. Then we have no choice. We must hit the button. If? No, sir. Not the button. Yes, RoboScott24601. 
the button. Macnog. Sorry, what? Make it so. Make what so? The button, Macnog. Push the button. Why did you just say that in the first place? Hello, hello, and welcome to the Franken Zone. Obviously, what you just saw wasn't real. <laughs> well, None of this is either, but what you saw earlier was, well, extra, not real. But imagine if it was real. Imagine if that was the direction we were going with. Then you'd go back to some of our older episodes and they would never be quite the same now, would they? That's right. Try going back and looking at us without knowing that Jason would one day be a starship captain, Scott would be a robot, and I would be an alien obsessed with gas. Okay, so some of it was real, I guess. Shut up. But as bad as that was, there have been movies whose clever storytelling and character development have suffered far worse. And many of these add-ons and changes in story and continuity often hurt or even butcher otherwise classic films or characters or plots with ridiculous sequels or prequels or both. So sit back, get out those cattle prods and uh, try to, you know what, I'm too tired. Here's 10 of them for you. Number 10. Die Hard with a Vengeance. This is sort of a minor one on the list, but it still does manage to take away some of the charm of the John McClane character who, in the first two movies, had his wife Holly as the constant driving hope for him to carry out his mission against the bad guys. In both Die Hard and Die Hard 2, we had the reluctant cop from New York, a victim of circumstance against some of the most notorious bad guys in the business of terrorism. Want money? What kind of terrorists are you? <laughs> Who said we were terrorists? Well, whatever they were. And though often overlooked with all the shoot 'em up action and fancy one-liners, Holly does play an important part to John McClane in terms of his character. She is the one constant spot of light and hope in his life. Take away Holly, and it's a lot like taking Lois Lane away from Superman. And Die Hard with a Vengeance did just that. Instead, John McClane is teamed up with Samuel L. Jackson, and what you get is more of the same old buddy cop crap that we've seen countless times. And knowing that in the end, Holly and John never truly find happiness sort of ruins it whenever you go back to the first two films. I mean, after all the crap he went through for her, and they still couldn't work things out? <laughs> <laughs> I could go on and on about other sequels and how they still managed to muck up John McClane's family life, but this was the first and probably biggest mistake. The movies themselves are okay, but without Holly, John McClane is just another action hero without heart. What's next? Breaking up his relationship with Damon Wayans? Oh, baby, what? oh God. I hope not. Number nine. Jaws, The Revenge. We've talked about this movie many times on this show. Many times. Yeah. And yes, despite its awfulness, we love it in the same way we love watching stupid people walk into glass walls. Hey, oh! But even we have to acknowledge the unforgivable that this movie has done to the beloved Brodies that have suffered from Jawsitis through four films. There are a couple of faults, such as the killing of Sean Brody, which makes it hard to go back and watch this scene again. There's also this strange scene with Mrs. Kittner. Remember her? Her son was killed by the shark in the first movie, and she later bitch slaps Roy Scheider, blaming him for her son's death. Yet here she is again comforting Mike Brody's family for losing Sean to a shark. Pretty weird, isn't it? I mean, you think she'd be like, good riddance, how do you like it, bitches? But nah, apparently they're all friends now. But the worst one of all, as many reviewers and fans have pointed out, 
is how they explain why Roy Scheider, Martin Brody, is nowhere to be found. Picked out Sean. It killed your father. Dad died from a heart attack. He died from fear. The fear of it killed him. Mom, 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 mom. Yep, that's it. He dies of a heart attack because he's all of a sudden scared to death of the shark. Smile, you son of a... I mean, sure, he's battled two of them up close and personal, triumphing both times, but the mere thought of a shark occurs and he croaks? How do you go back and watch him in the first two movies knowing that despite all of this cool shark fighting he does, he's just gonna one day curl up into an ass ball and die? Simple, you can. Then again, maybe he was talking to the producers instead of the mayor when he said this. I don't intend to go through that hell again. Number eight, Highlander 2, The Quickening. It's one thing to change a few character traits here and there. Make a superhero that was once campy dark and more serious, or make a tough cop more fun with more of a sense of humor. But changing the very fabric of the character itself is quite a risk and more often than not, a huge mistake. Take for example, the immortals in the cult classic Highlander. This movie was fantastic and introduced us to a new type of fantasy archetype, the immortal. A man or woman that can walk the earth forever unless they're decapitated and lose their power. They roam the world through time battling one another with swords. They have their own version of a spider sense able to sense when one of their own is near. Should have like comic book geeks actually. So when the sequel Highlander 2 The Quickening came along and what did they do to these mysterious and intriguing characters of sci-fi fantasy? They decided to make them aliens. <laughs> yep, it is in the wretched sequel we learn that the immortals are actually from another planet called Zeist or Geist or something stupid. And, you know, really, is there any need to go on from there? All of a sudden, modern times mixed with medieval sorcery turns into a modern time meets campy sci fi crap recycled from Masters of the Universe. And despite still loving the original movie, I can't look at these characters with the same sort of awe knowing in the back of my mind that they're simply aliens. They're screwing with characters and just flat out destroying them. This is the latter. Number seven, Alien 3. Both Alien and Aliens have been hailed as some of the best in sci-fi horror. And the reason, besides the horrific aliens themselves, is that both movies had such great characters. And while Alien had its share of memorable people, Aliens perhaps had more memorable ones. Besides Ripley, there was Bill Paxson as Hudson. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. Lance Henriksen as Bishop. <laughs> and Paul Reiser as a total dickwad. This is a multi-million dollar installation, okay? He can't make that kind of decision. He's just a grunt. I, no offense. None taken. And also, unlike the first film, Ripley is not the only survivor. Bishop lived. Sort of. And so did the adorable little renegade Newt and badass Michael Bane as Hicks. So, when Alien 3 premiered, fans were waiting with great anticipation as to how these survivors would hold up once again, battling those pesky penis-headed parasites. And as soon as the film began, we find out they all died. Really? It's a tragedy. Out of Macbeth. Well, yeah, okay, Ripley didn't, but Newt, Hicks, they were just killed? They didn't survive? After all the bonding between Hicks and Ripley, the mother-daughter-like relationship between Ripley and Newt, all that wonderful character development, and they just sweep it aside. And for what? Rock? Regardless of the reasons, this is a very disappointing way to begin the movie. And of course, we can never fully go back and enjoy Aliens the same way, knowing that all the hard work and fight these characters had to endure would be all for nothing. This sadly happens a lot to sequels involving James Cameron movies, but more on that later. Stay tuned. Especially in Titanic, they all died. They did all die in the end of Titanic. Did not see that coming. Mm. Number six, Austin Powers, the spy who shagged me. For those who remember when Mike Myers was funny, No, not that one. It sucks, as it cuts. <laughs> it certainly does suck. Yeah, that's him. 
One cannot mention the name of this ex-SNL comedian without quoting from his comedic hit, Austin Powers. And while there are many things wrong with this movie, both intentionally... I'm dead sexy! Look at my sexy body! Oh, yeah! And, well, not intentionally. Oh, behave! <laughs> not if I can help it! No! <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, your acting was so bad in this. Sucked. There is one thing The Spy Who Shagged Me did that is unforgivable to many fans, and that was learning that Elizabeth Hurley from the original movie was a fembot all along. Yeah, you remember the fembots, beautiful robot women whose boobs were also machine guns, whose only weakness was a very unappealing dance from the guy who gave a Shrek. Sure, they were funny, but what wasn't funny was the opening to Austin Powers' The Spy Who Shagged Me, which opens up right where the first one left off. Austin Powers and his sexy partner agent turned wife are enjoying wedded bliss when before you can say let down, Vanessa fembots out and tries to kill Austin Powers. And sadly doesn't succeed, allowing three more Michael Myers characters to have about two seconds appeal before growing tiresome. Once again, this plot point totally destroys the comedic romance and charming chemistry between Vanessa and Powers, knowing in the back of your mind that she's actually a product of Dr. Evil's sexy C-3PO fetish. Number five, the Halloween sequels. What can you say about Michael Myers? We already said all that needs to be said. I'll take Wayne's World, but the rest of his movies really suck. No, I mean Michael Myers from the horror classic Halloween. That's what happened to him? Does Dana Carvey know? That's terrible. Why don't you write him a letter and ask him? That's a good call. I got a pen and paper right here. As I was saying... To wow. Dana. Michael Myers is probably Tom one of the Scott. most infamous cinema slashers of all time. Along with Jason and Freddy, Michael Myers was the first of the three to slice and dice his way into the hearts of horror hounds everywhere. Also, I would like to point out that Master of Disguise is very underrated. I think you deserve an Oscar. Of course, what made Michael Myers so fascinating was the mystery. The less you knew about him, the more horrifying he was. A seemingly normal all-American boy in an all-American family who, for no reason or reasons we don't really know, decides to kill his older sister. It's simple but effective, playing with our minds and imaginations. But then came Halloween 2, which revealed Jamie Lee Curtis to be Michael Myers' sister, and, well, several sequels later, it was sort of all downhill from there. After the failure of trying to steer clear of Michael Myers with Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, producers brought back the masked Master of Malice back, I'll say that ten times fast, and from then on his mysterious origin turned into a horrific soap opera. We learned of his niece Jamie, his satanic cult birth, and the reason of his evil being related to the lining of the cosmos, and by number eight the mystery and scares were gone and the absurdities began. And let's not even start on Rob Zombie's inept retelling. Oh my gosh. Does that suck? As a standalone movie, Halloween still works. It's a great horror film and still manages to creep you out. But of course, knowing what we know about Michael Myers in both his past and what happens to him in his future, the thrill of the mystery is gone, thus making Michael Myers less of a shape and more of a shit show. Was Dana Carvey Hans or Franz? Oh, I think it was Steve. Of course. Really? Steve? <laughs> Number four, Independence Day Resurgence. Independence Day has always been a personal favorite of mine. I've said it before, how I have a soft spot for big budget disaster movies, and this popcorn favorite has always been at the top of the list. And for merely 20 years, God, I'm old. We are all, we all are, yeah. You too, yeah. Yep. I have salivated for the sequel that had been rumored to be happening since the box office numbers came in for the first one. And now that it's happened, all I can say is, I've wasted 20 years of patience. Again, we all have. Yeah. This movie is flat out garbage, and for many reasons. But the ultimate flaw in the film is, of course, the lack of Will Smith, who, 
let's face it, made the first one what it was. Welcome to Earth. Now I know the whole reason was because he didn't want to do this movie and ask for too much money. And if he had read the script, who could blame him? But the part that really got many fans pissed was the explanation as to why Will Smith's character was missing from the action. Captain Hiller, considering he died during a test flight, how do you feel taking off for the moon from a hangar named after your father? He would have loved it. Yeah, a test explosion. Bull crap. This is a bigger insult than Brody Shark's scare attack in Jaws 4. What an insult. Not just to Will Smith. I mean, yeah, maybe they purposely gave him a stupid death as like an F you for not you know, wanting to be in the sequel, but don't take it out on the fans. We love the original and we love these characters. And now every, every time we revisit the first movie, we're gonna know that despite all Will Smith's alien butt kicking, his life is gonna be cut short by a simple amateurish test explosion. Number three, Jurassic Park three. Like the Independence Day sequel, Jurassic Park 3 had many things wrong with it, and our particular qualm with this movie may not have been as large or as important as some of the other issues with this craptastic dinosaur romp, but it was definitely one of the dumbest. Yeah, romp. The original Jurassic Park had many things going for it besides the obvious dinosaur special effects and cool action scenes. There was a charm to the movie that only Spielberg could create. There was charm with Richard Attenborough between Grant and the two kids, and the quirkiness with the supporting cast like Jeff Goldblum. Must go faster. The lawyer. <laughs> are, are these characters uh, auto erotica? No, 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 we have no animatronics here. No. And even Nedry. And of course there was the present love between Laura Dern and Sam Neill. It was a minor point to the film, and yes, overshadowed by all the dinosaur scenes, but still it was there and did create a genuine and affectionate chemistry between these two characters. And what better way for Jurassic Park 3 to make an entrance than by splitting the two up? And they also killed the T-Rex. Oh yeah. Right. But splitting the two up, I mean, come on, we're, we're, we're sensitive here. That's right, they're divorced in this movie. For whatever reason, it didn't work out, thus making Sam Neill alone and dreaming about talking raptors. Alan. And Laura Dern no longer out racing raptors, but playing June Cleaver to this guy, or whoever he is. Maybe a minor issue to many, but to us it's a downright cruel and stupid move. What was the point? And was that better? I'm sorry, but when you and your significant other survive an island living, breathing dinosaurs and then gently fly away into the sunset to powerful John Williams music, you live happily ever after, and that is that. Yeah. Damn right. Now, thanks to the third movie and this boneheaded move, all that magic and charm and chemistry between Laura Dern and Sam Neill is ruined. Worst move ever. And that's saying a lot with a movie that features this. Alan. At least that part was a dream. Too bad the rest of the movie wasn't. Number two, Karate Kid Part Two. Sticking with the whole relationship fact for a moment, let's talk about another movie magic couple turned catastrophe thanks to the moronic weavings of hack writers. Says the man who writes this show. Hey. Target version of Richard Belzer, shut up. I look nothing like him. Uh, you do. You seriously do. Seriously, look him up. Like, in ten years. The Karate Kid was the story about triumphing over the odds, overcoming the obstacles, proving yourself worthy, and pointing out that even Italians can pull off kick-ass ninja skills. It was our generation's Rocky, the ultimate feel-good story, and with it, an incredible budding relationship between Ralph Macchio and Elizabeth Shue. In many ways, her character is the very strength of Mr. Karate the Kid. His motivation, his drive, his need to perform soccer stunts, these are what gives Daniel LaRusso his heart. Sure, Mr. Miyagi is the trainer, the reason for his strength and growth as a fighter, but Hallie, Elizabeth Shue, is his heart and soul. And maybe his mom too, but she's only in it for like five scenes. 
and doesn't really do much. So when came time to do a sequel, and it was announced Elizabeth Shue would not be returning for another round of Praying Mantis kicks and 80s sidekick montages, we could only wonder how the writers were going to handle it. And this is what they came up with. She tells me that she's just fallen in love with some football player from UCLA. Why don't she just lie to me? Things could be worse. Yeah, well, don't worry about it. They are. Yeah, she leaves him for a football player. Are you fucking kidding me? Okay, maybe Elizabeth Shue didn't want to come back or couldn't be, but here for whatever reason. But no, Carter, please give me a break. Give her a better send off. I mean, leaving him for a jock, another muscle head? Was she really that stupid? Why not just stay with Johnny from the first movie in the first place? You're clearly taken in by the alpha male. After everything Daniel has learned and taken from her, after winning it all for her, after proving himself to her and her upscale Ritz family snobs, how could you possibly go back to the first movie and look at these two the same way? Everything that's built between the two of them swept aside for the stupid adolescent move of dumping the middle class fighter for the popular jock. Women can't live with them, can't kill them. Well, well, that's certainly been a lot of therapeutic baggage dumping during the segment. But we each have our own idea of the number one continuity calamity that we need to get off our chest. And since mine is the best, I will go first. Doubtful. We'll see target version Kevin James. <laughs> see, I can do it too. Moving on. You do look like Kevin James, by the way. Shut up, kid from Satan's Little Helper. Damn movie. Damn movie. Number one, Ted, Terminators, and Midichlorians. As some may or may not know, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, is my favorite movie of all time. But more than the movie, I love the whole idea of Terminator. Both this film and its predecessor offered us a powerful and imaginative tale of technology gone wrong. Nightmarishly wrong. Combine that with both films' continuous advances and special effects, and you have one of the greatest modern science fiction stories of all time. And with James Cameron managing the project, with the right team of writers and directors, these two films could have ushered in an entire series of excellent sci-fi mythology. And that's exactly what didn't happen. With James Cameron having Titanic on the brain, the Terminator series was handed off one film after another to Hollywood writers lacking an original idea or talent. There have been three films following Terminator 2, and all of them have managed to somehow turn the Terminator story canon on its head. Terminator 3, Rise of the Machine, had an appalling ending that basically contradicted the entire point of Terminator 2's inspiring message, there is no fate but what we make for ourselves, making the ending of the second movie pointless. Terminator Salvation featured Batman still not able to talk and traded any story for just mindless running away from robot scenes. Yeah, it didn't really hurt the franchise, but it didn't help it either. And of course, maybe the dumbest yet is Terminator Genesis, which tries to capture the power and nostalgia from the first movie in order to hide the film's scattered storyline and tries to sidetrack us from the equally inept reveal of John Connor actually being a robot. Yeah, the big plot twist in this movie pretty much stole the surprise twist to the opening of Austin Power, the spy who shagged him. Terminator 2 is still my favorite movie. And I maintain hope that when James Cameron comes back, he will restore order and balance to the series. Namaste. Uh, come on, I think old Arnold meeting young Arnold was pretty cool. Mm. Wouldn't know, haven't seen it. John Connor is a robot. Dumb. Dumb. More than Dude, I need to know. How, how do you know how bad it can be if you haven't even seen the damn movie yet? Before passing judgment, at How's least. How's that uh, remake of Fright Night? Hmm? Point taken. That's right, bitch. Well, all Scott's dealing with robot children, my issue is with a certain talking bear. Hi, my name is Bingo Bear. No, not that one. I'm referring to Ted, a movie I really enjoyed for both its special effects and its characters. Besides Ted himself, I found Mark Wahlberg and Mila Kunis a perfect match. A truly terrific comic duo. The dialogue exchange was charming, their love I'm scenes so for a raunchy John comedy seem very Ted genuine, oh, and of course playing oh, against a walking, oh, talking bear God, with Peter Griffin's yeah, voice and not you. being overshadowed is not easy for just anyone. So imagine my excitement when I learned Ted 2 was a go, and well, yeah, you can see where this is going. 
Boy, we're really hung up on movie romances, aren't we? Seems it. It's cool, man. Chicks dig men who cry and like touch their feelings or something. <laughs> what? Touch their feelings, huh? I blame it on us switching to frozen yogurt. Sucked. Gross. So yeah, evidently it didn't work out in Ted 2. Man, it's been six months since you guys got divorced. And everything seemed like it was gonna be so perfect. Yeah, well, you're not the first guy to marry the wrong girl. Poor old Mila, I guess, couldn't handle sharing her funky bunch with a stuffed bear version of Brian the dog. And don't get me wrong, I have nothing against Amanda Siegfried, and the movie was okay. You thinking what I'm thinking? Let's go down to the improv and yell sad suggestions? We need a historical event. Who's got an event? 9-11. All right, Starbucks. Okay, now who's in the Starbucks? Bill Cosby. You people are monsters. But it just didn't have the same character flow. At least the human characters, anyhow. It feels terrible to let you guys down all over again. And as is the case with the other failed romances on this list, that happily ever after feel of the first movie is ruined. The first one is always a treat to watch, but of course it will never feel quite the same with the romance between Mark and Mila. Oh well, and in the end I guess the important thing is that all men should be allowed to play with their bears. Can I feel your nose? He talks back. I really hate that clip. Well, mine luckily has nothing to do with romance because I don't believe in love. Hmm. As a boy, I was always a big fan of Star Wars. The original trilogy was one of the greatest pieces of sci-fi cinema I grew up with. The stories, the characters, the mythology, and of course, one of the greatest movie villains of all time, Darth Vader. And yeah, you know where this is going. It's great. It's the Phantom Menace. I mean, there are screw-ups, and there are screw-ups. And then there's this... This thing. Say what you want about the new movies coming out and their plot holes and cannon fodder, but I have yet to see anything that comes close to rivaling the most insidious of cinematic abortions. I have such hatred for the prequels, for many reasons, but to me, The Phantom Menace is by far the worst. But where to possibly begin? And why such hatred? Well, that can be answered with the two words most affected by these horrific abominations, the Force and Darth Vader. Uh, Mark, that's four words. I used hyphens. First off, try watching the original classic trilogy after seeing this garbage. Yeah, go ahead. Look at how evil the monstrous Darth Vader is. Oh, wait, remember this? Yippee! Or how about this? Are you an angel? Oh, and yeah, he built C-3PO. Did you know that? Yeah, no one did, including C-3PO. Our last master was Captain Antilles, but with all we've been through, this little R2 unit has become a bit eccentric. Apparently, it's never mentioned once in the original movies. How about Qui-Gon Jinn? Same thing. Yeah, remember him? You will go to the Dagobah system. Dagobah system. There you will learn from Yoda. The Jedi Master who instructed me. Neither did Ben Kenobi, since he never mentions him once. I'm sorry, but if you're gonna write prequels to movies with an established mythology, you can't just put together new characters and shove them into a story without respecting their characterizations in the already existing films. And then there's the Force. What an awesome and inspiring idea. The Force was, of course, that rhymes, the original trilogy symbol of mind over matter, an abstraction of faith that encompassed all ideas of religion, meditation, philosophy, a power greater than anyone could ever hope to objectify. But Lucas did it anyway, and thus, midichlorians were born. What are midichlorians? Midichlorians are a microscopic life form that resides within all living cells. And we are symbionts with them. Without the midichlorians, life could not exist, and we would have no knowledge of the Force. They continually speak to us, telling us the will of the Force. Yeah, all that cool stuff you see Yoda, Vader, and Luke do, turns out they have special cells floating through their Jedi DNA that basically give them these powers. Instead of an intriguing mystical energy from a great beyond, we now have something that seems like the plot of a leftover X-Men character. Oh my gosh, does that suck? The other two movies in the prequels had their own sins of the story arc. 
but I still say Phantom Menace holds the record, not only as the worst prequel of all time, but also the worst Star Wars movie of all time. And yeah, that even includes the holiday special. Yeah, that says something, right? When something like this... It's chewy. Whatever he's doing, there must be a reason. Well, somebody must know something. ...does far less damage to the Star Wars saga than this. And that wraps it up for yet another episode of The Franken Zone. And just know that while we like to joke around and mess with your heads, The Franken Zone will always stay the same show that all three of our viewers have come to know and love. Just ask Hutch Masterson. Yeah. Who? Who? Nothing. Well, that's right. I will always be the dashing leader. Mm. Scott will always be our funny guy, and... And Mark will always be our fat ball of grumpy gas. You know... <clears throat> very true, very true. So until next time, expect more of the same, always enjoyable antics of ours when the Franken Zone returns. Unless one of us gets killed off. <laughs> right, yeah, guys? Yeah, yeah. Just killed off. imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Fart drink an alien my ass. One for the road. I got a cramp in my foot. <laughs> <laughs>